heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we talk all things crypto, from where venture capital flows are headed to a letter from lawmakers accusing Binance of lying to Congress. We'll have more ahead. Plus, we'll discuss TikTok's e-commerce ambitions as the company eyes a $20 billion opportunity in the face of regulatory scrutiny. And of course, we've got to talk generative AI with a CEO of a platform that helps revenue teams boost their productivity. It's all about increasing sales growth. More to come when it comes to the private market. Let's focus in on the public market, said because today, bad news is good news. Today, the jobless claims are raging up higher, the start faster since October 2021. That cooling of what is a very strong labour market here in the US may be boding well in terms of inflationary pressures, what the Federal Reserve has to do to just calm down a very, well, shall we say, too fiercely hot economy in the US. We're seeing up 1.2% on the Nasdaq 100 as people hope maybe we don't have to hike rates as fast as we had to. Two-year yield therefore comes down in terms of six basis points on the front end of the curve. And actually, we're seeing growth in other economies. Dollar weaker versus the Japanese yen because Japan's economy grow faster than was previously expected. So this is the macro picture. Let's go into one key risk sentiment though for us. And it is the world of crypto. We're actually pushing on higher. Maybe the bad news is good news in the world of Bitcoin at the moment. We're up 1.3% but still just in that trading range. We're locked at 26,700 at the moment. This is, we really do have that regulatory overhang, Ed. But I know you're digging into maybe some more of the smaller cap names that are really moving today. Yeah, it's interesting that the Nasdaq 100 kind of marches on tech, a big driver of that. There is news flow driving different names. Amazon moving up to the upside, 3%, one of the best performers. A top pick at Wells Fargo and Margin View. Amazon's price target also raised at UBS on its AI benefits going through to the cloud division, GameStop moving to the downside. The CEO's gone and they missed on sales. We're going to bring you more details later in the program on that. Lucid, now actually just modestly higher, up two-tenths of a percent, had been markedly higher earlier in the session. Reuters reporting that Lucid is going to move into the Chinese EV market. And then Adobe, AI, 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 generative AI subscription, boosting the stock uh, by about 5%. I think it's at an August high. We will bring you the details of that later in the program as well. I'm also continuing to look at Coinbase. Look at shares of Coinbase. We're up for a second straight session since the SEC sued Coinbase, accusing them of uh, securities laws breaches. We're up 1% at the moment. Of course, Brian Armstrong, CEO, was on the show 24 hours ago giving Coinbase's defense, talking about why he's happy to go to court and, and establish a baseline through the courts on how crypto exchanges should be governed in this country and also internationally. And we're going to dig deep into what's going on in this sector throughout the show, Karen. Yeah, let's talk about a different different crypto exchange, a global one, because Paris Senate Democrats, they're wanting the Justice Department to investigate whether Binance lied to lawmakers about its business practices. We, in fact, spoke with Senator Elizabeth Warren earlier. Let's just have a listen. It is a crime to lie to Congress. And uh, we have gotten information from Binance. They've given answers to me and to others in Congress that seem to be entirely inconsistent with now what the Justice Department, or now what the SEC is charging that Binance has done. And I want the Justice Department to take a look. If they lied to Congress, they need to be held accountable. We, of course, are out for comment from Binance, but this news is all in the back of the SEC suing the company and its co-founder, CZ. Joining us now is the host, co-host of Bloomberg's Crypto, it's Kayleigh Lines, in the building here in New York, having been helping with the Bloomberg Invest event. And so important to have you here, because what a week for crypto. And yeah. why do we think we're hearing from these particular senators? What do they want done? Well, what Senator Warren, as well as Senator Chris Van Holland, another Democrat from Maryland, want is for the Justice Department to look into this matter. Basically, this all comes down to the question of whether Binance U.S. actually operated independently for Binance.com, the global entity. That is what uh, Elizabeth Warren and Senator Van Hollen want to find out. But that also is included in the allegations made by both the SEC and the CFTC in their lawsuit from several months ago. Uh, allegations that these were not, in fact, operating as separate entities. Of course, in the SEC lawsuit against the company NCZ. There's also a bevy of other uh, charges, wash trading, misleading, 
uh, customers commingling uh, funds improperly, all of that. But what is important to note is when the regulators put these cases forward, these are civil charges. When senators are asking the Justice Department to look into something like perjury, that could actually be a criminal charge. The point being, though, that who's responsible for this? CZ at the moment, I mean, he's out in the Middle East. Yep. He, of course, has various bank accounts, we seem to understand as well, that money is flowing. And I know Ed wants to get to that in a moment. But, I mean, what about the leadership of Binance US ultimately here? Well, that's a really good question because, again, it was supposed to be operating independently. A lot of uh, pushback against that notion has been placed on the part of regulators and lawmakers as well. But the role of CZ is interesting because, as you said, he is in, in the Middle East at the moment. There is also another DOJ uh, investigation ongoing into potential sanctions violations. It would become a question of whether there uh, actually was something brought to the DOJ, what potentially extradition uh, might look like. So there's a lot of questions around the individual in addition to the broader exchange, which of course is the biggest in the world. And when the Justice Department is asking uh, for a freeze of Binance U.S. assets, we also have to keep in mind how this ultimately could impact the broader system. Overnight, Kathy Wood joined our colleagues over in Asia on that programming. And as we know, she's been adding uh, to holdings of Coinbase. This is what she had to say about the breadth of this situation, Kaylee. And it is unfortunate that the SEC uh, took action against Coinbase the day after Binance and then seemed to mud uh, Chairman Gensler as he was on uh, one of the major news channels was trying to implicate Coinbase in the same way that he was implicating uh, Binance. No, they're, they're, they're very different. You know, so we, we remind ourselves that in the same week, the SEC sued mm -hmm. both Coinbase and Binance. Interesting Brian Armstrong's comments 24 hours ago that he felt the timing was relating to conflating the two different suits. Yeah, and we have to keep in mind, as you rightly allude to, that the Binance uh, allegations from the SEC are fi far wider ranging. Both were accused of, of violating securities laws, but that really is that and the staking product is what uh, Coinbase was facing. So that becomes just a definition question about what is and isn't a security and ultimately the jurisdiction of the SEC. And as we talk about interesting timing, I was on Capitol Hill on Tuesday at the House Agriculture Committee, which was holding a hearing on the market structure legislation uh, that has been put forward by that committee and House Financial Services to try and delineate jurisdiction between the CFTC having control of digital commodities and the SEC when it comes to digital securities. And many of the lawmakers I spoke with at that hearing suggested that the timing was interesting. And one of them, Congressman uh, Zach Nunn, a Republican, was saying that it seems like Gary Gensler is trying to empire build and suggesting that he's trying to front run Congress, actually uh, setting the rules of the road by taking all of this action uh, at this time. Uh, Kaylee, this is Bloomberg. We follow the money. Mm. It's interesting to join the dots of 2023. I think back to Silvergate and Signature Bank and Bloomberg reporting that there is a $70 billion trail as it relates to Binance and those two banks. Yeah, as we know, these banks that are no longer uh, in existence, both of them failed earlier this spring. Silvergate was really the first one. This was a bank that catered largely to crypto clients. And we now understand via an SEC filing that was actually uh, filed in support of the motion to freeze the assets of Binance US, that $70 billion, as you say, Ed, was funneled through both Silvergate and Signature Bank by Binance and, and related equities. I believe it was... Uh, $50 billion of deposits at Silvergate and then another 19 that signature handled, including large amount of uh, uh, large amounts of money moving in uh, a couple of days, uh, a period. So it's unclear whether or not those banks actually flagged some of those transactions or not. But this is, as you say, just kind of following the money trail uh, of this as the SEC puts forward these allegations and asks for that injunction. Bloomberg's Katie Lyons visiting us from DC in New York. Thank you very much. Now coming up, we're gonna stick with crypto and we're gonna talk with Chris Lahane of Horn Ventures, of course, big name out in DC, and also a new relationship with Coinbase that we'll get into. As we head to break, watching shares of Alphabet, parent company of Google, the journal reporting that Google will consider office attendance records in performance reviews and send reminders to employees who have frequent absences. That report citing an internal email written by Google's chief people officer. This is Bloomberg.
innovation that we could point to and say there's an enormous opportunity to have like another industrial revolution that just might be more of a digital revolution and a science revolution, that could unleash a lot of productivity, but we need something to get more growth in the economy that will allow us to deal with some of the challenges we're going to face. John Walden, Goldman Sachs speaking earlier. Um, look, the artificial intelligence revolution that we keep discussing, he was talking about it at Bloomberg Invest, and it follows interesting comments yesterday from Stanley Druckenmiller, also at our Bloomberg Invest event, who said, unlike crypto, AI is real. So what does that mean about crypto? We actually asked our audience. You took to our poll yesterday, does AI have more staying power than crypto? I was amazed at kind of how neck and neck everything was. Staying power, 39%, 37%, many will fail, too early to tell. So it doesn't feel like artificial intelligence is leaps and bounds ahead of crypto staying power. Let's ask one Hannah Miller, who I'm pleased to say is also visiting New York because you've got a great new podcast on the downfall of FTX. Meanwhile, though, the downfall of crypto, I mean, is crypto showing resilience? I mean, it's interesting that Bitcoin actually hasn't been marred too much in some of the pushback from an SEC level. Yeah, we've seen some resilience here, and there are obviously founders and VCs who are still very confident in crypto. We have seen this shift, though, where some crypto founders and even some crypto VCs are diving more into the intersection between crypto and AI. So that's been really exciting to track. OK, of course they are. And I remember that sort of meme that everyone's suddenly an AI expert now and leaving crypto. But what is the intersection? Where are we seeing value being created, people getting excited? Yeah, so people see a lot of promise in using blockchain for identity. Hmm. So there's a startup called Tools for Humanity, which was co-founded by Sam Altman. They developed WorldCoin, which they say will provide proof of personhood, that you can use this blockchain-based identity to show that you are indeed human. So that's been very interesting. They also scan your eyeballs in order to create this identity. So that's a lot us. of mixed concerns about that. I actually saw yes. it was an A16Z event in New York and saw someone with the helmet on from WorldCoin. Yeah, there are concerns about you know, the sensitivity of this biometric data. Is it safe? Is it being protected? So, you know, I think we do see some of the ethical concerns within AI bleeding over into the intersection between AI and crypto. But for now, both still being eyed up by VCs. Hannah Miller is across it all at that intersection. But let's just pivot back a little bit more to the world of crypto because it has been done the pressure, certainly from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, I actually am envious of Hannah Miller because that's a great beat to have <laughs> because everyone that was pummeling money into that space has just pivoted. So we are reporting. Good guest to talk about that with, Chris Lahane, Han Ventures Chief Strategy Officer, but also a member of Coinbase's Global Advisory Council. So let's start there, actually. It is the story of the week. Mm -hmm. The SEC suing Coinbase, alleging securities breaches. What does your role entail as an advisory member to that yeah. global board? So thanks for having me, as always. Uh, so Coinbase has stood up and announced a global advisory board. It's bipartisan, has Democrats and Republicans. It's global. You know, my specific role is I have a bit of a background um, of having worked with disruptive, innovative companies, trying to work within the system in a responsible way to bring regulatory certainty and clarity. People also call you a political operator. <laughs> well, that's another way of maybe putting it, but, but politics is always part of that. Um, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, we live in a democracy, small d democracy. Politics does ultimately impact, as it should, and inform policy, which ultimately brings regulatory certainty. Uh, and so a lot of what I've done over my career, I've been in government, I've run major campaigns, uh, and I've certainly advised really innovative companies that are disrupting the status quo. But how can they do that in a really responsible right. way? Uh, and I think Coinbase, you know, in the crypto space has been really that leading platform seeking to do it in a responsible way. U.S. based, going through the processes, working with regulators. It's disruptive. It's trying to update the financial system. That's a big deal. But it's trying to really do it in a responsible way. Um, Brian Armstrong. 24 hours ago was asked about the timing of the SEC filing suits against both Coinbase and Binance in a matter of 48 hours. Yeah. He, he, the word he used was conflate or confuse. What, what's your reaction to the timing of those two actions? So I grew up in Maine and we used to have a saying, when you go to bed at night and there's no snow on the ground and you wake up in the morning and there's snow, you can pretty safely conclude that it has snowed over the course of the evening. This is a sort of policy version of that. I think members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, have expressed concern about the timing of this. And I'll say this as someone who has been in government. Uh, historically in this country, our regulators that oversee financial sectors have been understood and really by design 
to be fair arbiters, to be umpires, to call balls and strikes. And I do think if you look at how this played out this week, taking something that's apples and something that's oranges, conflating them and putting them together, and doing it right before there's a major congressional hearing to actually begin the process of bringing clarity to this space, I do think that raises some serious, profound questions. Like, our system works because there is a rule of law. Part of that rule of law is those umpires calling those balls and strikes fairly. Uh, I think in this process, some real serious questions have been raised. Okay, so the rules. Yep. I remember two years ago when Coinbase filed to go public, it wrote in no uncertain terms, there is a high degree of uncertainty regarding the legality of operations. It wrote, regulators may disagree with the company's view. It isn't covered by their rules. And Brian Armstrong's welcoming the opportunity to go to court and use that to set precedent. Is that a good idea, a good way of resolving this? You know, ultimately, you're going to have to break the eggs a little bit to make the omelet on this. I think that's part of this process and part of the journey. Um, and so I do think one way or the other, either through the legal process or through legislation, you are going to get clarity. But which is better to you? Well, look, in, in my view, as someone who comes out of politics and policy, like, the country should have a first principles approach. Right? There should be a strategic approach to how you want to deal with this industry. The rest of the world is actually moving forward really fast to put frameworks in place. They specifically want to be crypto hubs because they understand that this is going to be a big part of the financial rails of the future. If you default to a legal process, companies like Coinbase will certainly get their clarity. Remember, this involves 12 tokens out of more than 200 that the platform has on its exchange. But you'll get the clarity through that. I think it's far better from a U.S. perspective, from an economic perspective, a competitive perspective, from a national security perspective, if you're actually doing this with a real strategy. Look, I was involved in the 1996 Telco Act. You know, that began with a really whole set of complex ideas. President Bill Clinton took a big step back and said, hey, look, at, let's have a first principles approach. I want tech to be based in the United States. That's what I want. And he put forth legislation and right. done in a bipartisan way. You flash forward to where we are today. The U.S. has emerged as the center of the global economy because we are the center of tech. Well, paradoxically, emphasis on the word global mm -hmm. in your advisory title. Sure. So how does Coinbase grow itself outside yeah. of the jurisdiction of the United States to your mind? I mean, what are you advising them to do? Well, I think they've been doing a great job of diversifying where they are geographically as well as their products and services. You know, Brian has done a little bit of a world tour. Brian Armstrong, the CEO, over the last couple of months, was in London, has been in Dubai, a uh, company's been in Brazil. These are all places that are actually putting frameworks in place. I mean, the U.K. has an announcement today about the next steps in its process. The PM has made clear, Prime Minister Sunak has made clear he wants London to be a hub. Uh, you think of the historic rails that have existed in London, historically going back several hundred years. You know, one of the first central banks was developed in London, the Bank of England. Um, and you think of the Commonwealth and the role that, those, that, that crypto could play in actually uh, advancing that system. Like, I think Sunak actually sees enormous opportunity here and has talked about it. But that's not the only place. Japan this week right. actually moved forward with specific regulations and activity. Uh, and again, so you see what is happening. There was a recent report from Electric Capital, another venture firm here in the Valley, and they indicated that the U.S. is losing market share of crypto developers. A million jobs, high-quality engineering jobs on the table in the next five or six years. Right. Are they going to take place here? Or are we going to send that offshore? And look, just this week, it was an interesting week for us at, at Han. You know, we announced a, a, a project, or a project that we're invested in was announced. Um, it's called Argus Labs. It's the first sort of computer gaming uh, uh, platform right. built on top of blockchain. The founder of this is a young 20-year-old, uh, came from Indonesia at the age of 16 to the University of California computer science program, graduated really early. Like, he is literally the first round pick that you want if you're a country. Well, where is he, in one word? And he's here in the United States building this project. Right. And he should be. This is, we want to attract these jobs and these entrepreneurs. All right, Chris Lahane of Han Ventures, never enough time with you. Thank you. This is Bloomberg. Time now for Talking Tech. First up, want to make use of your car when you're not using it yourself? Well, look, Uber has plans for that. The ride-hailing giant will launch Uber Car Share. It's a peer-to-peer -peer service that it says will make its business more sustainable, competing with startups like Getaround and Turo. Meanwhile, the company wants to cut emissions too. 
to zero by converting its entire fleet of cars to electric by 2040. Teslas are the highest selling cars in, in terms of electric vehicles by mile. At the same time, we're not, you know, we want electrification to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not just going to happen with Tesla. You know, we need Fords out there, GMs out there, Toyotas out there, etc. We need all these other players to go electric. Dara Kozlashahi with Emily Chang there. Meanwhile, Adobe says it's willing to take up certain legal fees for its users with its new artificial intelligence subscription. For a flat rate, users can use its AI tools across Adobe products with legal assurance against copyright infringement claims. Plus, TikTok, it wants to expand its global e-commerce business to as much as $20 billion in merchandise sales this year. Sources say the video content apps is banking on rapid growth in Southeast Asia, in particular likes of Indonesia. Expansion in Europe or here in the US, that's also expected. And it's interesting considering some of the legal pushbacks that we're getting from lawmakers in both particular regions, Ed. Yeah, I want to stick with this company in this story because it's one we track closely here with more details. Bloomberg's technology editor, Sarah Fryer. They're just plowing on business despite the regulatory headwind it, it is it's really fascinating too that this is this is an area that a lot of their competitors have stumbled on we've seen Instagram try social shopping we've seen YouTube we've seen a lot of other attempts at getting US users and European users to mix their scroll with getting their credit card out and it just hasn't worked as well in the US as it has in China that's not to say that TikTok couldn't make it work because of course, they have had great success um, in, in all of these endeavors that we thought mm -hmm. they might not do well at. Um, but one reason they need to is because the advertising business, just like it is for everyone else, is slowing. Good diversification point there. Also, it probably won't be bad to get some big U.S. European retailers liking the business model. I, I don't think it would be bad. And I, and I think... Also, um, when you look at this 20 billion number, they're not really relying on the U.S. and Europe to get there. They're going to be relying on Southeast Asia, in particular Indonesia, where this behavior is very strong. And so I, I think that you know, for this year, it's really going to be a, a test case in the U.S. and Europe. But they're hoping to get to that 20 billion mostly just by expansion in those markets. Well, getting some other key voices perhaps to fight for your... Well, remaining within certain countries and operating, I'm sure, wouldn't be a negative from outcome for these particular TikTok at the moment. Sarah Fry, always great to have her on, talking about what is a key focus of the business. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we're going to talk revenue in a different area now. Revenue intelligence platform, Gong, is out with its own generative AI models. More on that with the CEO up next, Amit Bendov. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow out here in San Francisco, paying a quick attention uh, carry to the markets. Interesting day. A lot of green on the screen. Look at the Nasdaq 100. The charge continues up 1.4%. You talked about it earlier. It's a case of kind of good news is bad news or bad news is good news as it relates to economic data and the Fed jobless claims coming in higher than expected last week. Elsewhere, we see chips push higher. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index up 1.3%. Yields pulling back a little bit, 3.7% on the U.S. 10-year. And Bitcoin staying at around $26,500 US do uh, dollars per token. There's been volatility in our favorite risk asset with what's been going on with the SEC, Binance, and Coinbase. Uh, in terms of specific movers, I actually want to take another look at Adobe. I know that we've got the details of what's going on in terms of the subscription uh, for their generative AI offering. But we're up 5% now. This is a stock trading at an August high, but the second best performer on the S&P 500. AI continues to be a driver in this market, in news flow, but also in equities. And I think that's so interesting because another day, another headline, and investors seem to buy it, Karen. And another announcement as well. They come thick and fast. We want to talk about the latest generative AI announcement coming from Gong. It's an AI platform that helps revenue teams really boost their productivity to increase sales growth. Today, they're announcing Gong Engage, an AI-driven sales engagement solution using customer interactions. Here to discuss the product and its own proprietary generative AI models. CEO, Armit Bendov. Thank you for joining us, Armit. And look, how long was this in the making? Are you suddenly flurrying out new announcements because everyone else has got one? Or has this been something that you're building for a while? I 
founded the company in 2015 when I realized that uh, I was a, a CEO of a company here in New York City, mm. and I realized that our people are spending like way too much time entering customer information like into our CRM system, and 99% of the work doesn't get done, and they hate it. Mm. So my thinking was, if AI can beat the world champion in chess, and if AI can diagnose cancer better than doctor, why it can't do all these like drudgery better than people? That was the idea for Gong, and that's what we uh, uh, that's what we started, and that's what we've been building ever since. Okay, so if you've been building on these announcements, for example, since 2015, does it frustrate you that yesterday we had Twilio on discover, discussing their generative AI, the day before everyone's got some latest announcement? It excites me. Why would it frustrate it? Uh, when we started, it was a challenge to raise money because people didn't believe that AI can replace uh, people's work. Now we don't have to prove that. Companies are coming, we need to reduce costs with AI. How can you help? So it actually provides like huge validation. We're excited. We think like every company is going to have something with AI. The question like, what are you doing with that? So it's actually super helpful and exciting. Uh, to that point, what really got everyone realizing the potential of AI was, of course, ChatGPT. It's unveiling in November and the iterations thereafter. What, why are you basing it on your own generative AI models, your own proprietary data? Great question. Uh, we have about 60 models. We also use OpenAI's uh, model, which is great, but we have like special purpose uh, uh, models for almost everything from understanding speech, from punctuating text, from summaries, identifying action items, recommending people within organizations. So, uh, when you train specific model, you can get much higher accuracy and reliability uh, rather than relying on public domain knowledge. Hmm. I mean, have you already started thinking about efficiencies? And, you know, hard to ask, but eliminating roles at your company because of the impact that these tools will have? 70% of customer facing time is wasted on non-productive work. It's things like updating record, internal meetings, uh, uh, sifting through records. Uh, and these are people that are making six figures. So it doesn't make sense to do all of the work. All along we said AI can replace that. And, and our users love that they don't have to do this drudgery. Uh, they can spend more time with customers. So it doesn't necessarily mean like eliminating jobs, it means eliminating the drudgery from our day to day. You talked about being sort of technology agnostic, 60 LLMs, I think you said that you were utilizing. But what's it like doing business with OpenAI? Is it good value for money for you, you building something on top of GPT 3.5 or 4? I'm not sure what you use. Yes, they've been a great partner. We've been working with them for over a year and allows early access to the latest stuff and it allows us to use them for some of the applications. So it's been uh, uh, wonderful to work with and we're excited that they're, they're uh, successful in helping uh, uh, prove to the world that AI is, is real and can make like a huge difference. Since you've shown your hand in your competence of generative AI tools, how many of your investors have phoned you asked if you should raise more money, asked about valuation. Do you have a higher valuation now that AI is attached to your business? There, uh, we've raised plenty of money. Uh, we've raised uh, $600 million uh, to date. Like even before AI was cool, people saw the user excitement and the value that Gong is creating. So we don't need to raise. We're not uh, raising right now. We're actually not burning a ton of money. But definitely there is a ton of inbound interest. There's no shortage of people that want to invest, that they recognize uh, the massive tectonic shifts that we're experiencing right now. Amit, we came to you off a look at Adobe and the fact that they're willing to take some, well, legal risk on board. And we are beset with what are the ramifications of generative AI? What are the copyright? What is the bias? What is the, the negative repercussions? How do we regulate it? How are you thinking about that within your business? Uh, AI is, is powerful and needs to be regulated. We put a lot of effort both on uh, uh, privacy, security, uh, disclosure of information. Mm. So the system needs to be helpful mm. and not threatening to people, right? So everything is transparent. And I think like every company should put uh, regulatory uh, control. And I think uh, both at the company level, but also at the country and a global level. 
Amit, great to have some time with you. We thank you. Amit Bendov, of course, of Gong, the CEO there. Meanwhile, talking of AI, look, the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, is on a diplomatic visit right here to the US. He's in Washington, and he's seeking stronger economic ties with the United States. But Sunak is also pursuing a leadership role for the UK in the international regulation of, you guessed it, AI. This follows the UK government's announcements last night that it's going to be hosting the first major global summit on artificial intelligence safety in the fall. On that note, President Biden will hold a joint press conference with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in just about an hour's time. And you can tune in on the terminal at LiveGo if you're lucky enough to have one in. Coming up, more on AI and on the investing side this time with Kleiner Perkins, Bucky Moore. That's next. Got to take a look at Carvana. This is a monster move. Currently up 42%, Caro. Mm. Had been up 51%, biggest move on record on an intraday basis. Better than expected forecast for financial results. This is like the vending machine of cars, right? <laughs> Picture it stacked high. You press the button, the car you want, and it spits out. But also a heavy emphasis on online sales during the pandemic. That shortage of second hand. Just we'll, we'll track this one. It's absolutely insane. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Artificial intelligence company Cohere has raised $270 million from a mix of venture capital and strategic investors, according to Cohere's president and COO. Inovia Capital led the round with participation from Oracle, NVIDIA and Salesforce Ventures, existing inventor, investor index ventures and some others. The startup is valued in the round at $2.1 billion to $2.2 billion, according to a Bloomberg source. Let's stick with the world of VC and AI and bring in Bucky Moore, partner at Kleiner Perkins, who's been focused on investments across infrastructure, compute and AI for the firm for, I would say, quite some time. Uh, welcome to the program. I've always just wanted to sit down with you and say, what is going on in your world? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. And in terms of what's going on in our world, we are in the midst of a sea change that AI is driving in terms of how technology is really impacting our working and personal lives. And I think when we see a generational shift come along like this as venture capitalists, we get really excited. And what we're focused on at this moment is really partnering with these innovative, visionary founders that have a unique point of view in how to bring this technology to big markets. And in doing so, hopefully make all of our working and personal lives a lot more interesting, more efficient, and, and exciting. When I look at your portfolio companies and also the types of exits, what do I conclude you're focused on? AI native or AI adjacent companies because every enterprise SaaS software company is now saying, oh, I'm an AI company. So I consider myself to be an infrastructure investor. And what I mean by infrastructure is the underpinnings that power these digital experiences that we're increasingly relying on to live our lives. And when I think about AI, I think of it as yet another one of these underpinnings that is going to change how software gets developed, change the kind of software that we find in our working and personal lives and ultimately bring all of these new capabilities to the world that we just haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking about it from that lens as yet another piece of infrastructure. Okay, Bucky, go deep for us for a moment because reading your note that you put out each year, it was back in the end of February you put it out, but the future of infrastructure, and even then you were calling about the impact of AI. You were talking about integrating it into software, vector databases as something you were looking at, built for storage. Where, for you, starts to attract you of allocating money right now? Because you must be besieged with opportunities. Yeah, so taking a step back, we think about this space really in three layers. At the very bottom layer, what you have is the hardware and software that allows us to deliver these computing platforms that help us train and develop these models. At the layer above that, you have tooling and infrastructure that helps us integrate these models into the software that makes the, the technology usable and accessible. And then, of course, at the very top layer, what you have are applications. And so exa examples of these applications in the Kleiner Perkins portfolio include companies like Glean, who's bringing language models to business search, or Synthesia, who's bringing diffusion models to generative video. And what we see time and time again is that value can accrue at all three layers of that stack. And so as an infrastructure investor, specifically at Kleiner Perkins, what I'm very focused on are those bottom two layers. So the infrastructure that allows us to deliver these computing platforms that ultimately make it possible to develop and train these models, and the tools and infrastructure, such as vector databases, that make it possible for developers to integrate these models into their applications. Those models, in particular the foundational models, Bucky, does it matter whether we end up going more towards proprietary models and open AI? Does it 
end up being more open source? Do we have more of a hugging face situation? Does it does it matter ultimately? Because it's interesting that of course Klein and Perkins well, made its name on backing what are now incredibly huge companies that are deep within AI, I think, of Google. Is, are they going to eat all the lunch, or is there room for startups in the space? So, Caroline, I think it absolutely matters. It matters a lot. And the way I think it matters is time and time again, what we've seen is that technology that comes along that is as useful as this, it tends to trend towards commoditization. And an embodiment of that trend towards commoditization is the proliferation of open source alternatives to these proprietary models that we're really starting to see um, more and more often actually stand up to the capabilities that developers are looking for when, when pursuing use cases with AI. So I think it matters a lot. And I personally hope and believe that we're going to enter a world where we're going to have best in class models that are proprietary in nature from the likes of companies like OpenAI and Anthropic and so on. And then we're going to have a vast landscape of open source models that asymptotically approach the performance of those best in class proprietary models over time, but also make this technology accessible to anyone. There is a temptation for us to spend the entire show talking about AI, <laughs> but other things are going on in your world. The story of the week is Sequoia splitting into three businesses. I know that Kleiner Perkins' China business basically operates independently as well. But what do you make of that? And I guess if we are going to tie it to AI, we recognize there are entrepreneurs in China doing things in the field of AI as well. So the venture capital industry continues to evolve and has evolved a substantial amount over the past few decades. And one of the ways it's evolved is it's grown a lot in size. But at Kleiner Perkins, our view is ultimately focus is the winning formula. And what we mean by focus is focus on stage, focus on sector, and focus on geography. So the Kleiner Perkins that you see today is one that is really thinking through that lens of focus and shaping our strategy. And I think that's where we'll be for many years to come. And uh, that's ultimately what we think the winning formula is in this business. What's the read through from that to crypto? And I, I know that's not thematically your area, but what we hear from, from the VCs that come on this program is all the inbound has disappeared. And anyway, all of our outbound is going to AI. I just wondered what your view was on that. So I think all of the regulatory conversations that are going on with respect to crypto make it a very uncertain place for new businesses to be built. And so I think what you are starting to see is that there's a shift in attention towards AI, which is very fertile ground by comparison at the moment. My hope is that the regulatory conversation comes to a head in, in a way that continues to allow people to innovate in that space as well. But what we're seeing now is undoubtedly a skew towards AI. I hate to bring it up, but AI doomers or optimists. I mean, you sound relatively optimistic about all the productivity that can be drawn from this. But what do you make of either the worry about, well, the destruction of humanity or indeed the more near term risks of bias and and other risks that are currently being involved in this situation when we apply AI? So I think it's absolutely critical that as we start to shape the future of this technology, both from the innovation and the regulatory side, that both of those sides come together so that one another's perspectives are heard and that we are able to balance safety and innovation as we move the regulatory landscape forward around this technology. And I think if we skew one way or the other too far, the outcome will be, will be suboptimal. And so I think that balance is really what I'm looking for and what I'm optimistic that we'll find as an industry. Bucky Moore, it's been great having time with you. Thank you, partner at Kleiner Perkins. Very cerebral there. More insights are coming from venture capitalists for you a little bit later. Bloomberg Invest is right here in New York. And I'm going to be sitting down with Rebecca Caden of USV, Dina Shaker of Lux Capital. 3.30 p.m. New York time, 12.30 over in San Francisco. You don't want to miss it. Stream it on LiveGo or online. Meanwhile, everyone's here in New York. Guess who's up next? Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Uh-oh. She's going to be telling us about Ed the Circuit, the new Bloomberg Originals program that she's hosting, and some of the guests that she's got to speak to, including some former Twitter executives. She's but back. all these people are in New York, Ed, and they're all here to suffer currently what is some pretty bad breathing quality, air quality. So just having a quick look at New York City schools, they're currently saying that they will be remote instruction day for students tomorrow, June 9th. Air quality currently 177, so is improving. But for now, it is still a high risk. This is Bloomberg.
Because it's been more than, what, 72 hours now since Elon Musk passed over that torch to Twitter's new CEO, Linda Yaccarino, after a pretty tumultuous reign as the head of the social company he took over. In the premiere of a new Bloomberg original series, Emily Chang sits down for an exclusive interview with the former CEO, Evan Williams, and Jason Goldman, one of the most critical members of the Twitter's founding, to discuss the move. Here's a peek at tonight's episode of The Circuit with Emily Chang. Yeah, it was surprising. I mean, I'm trying to remember the first bursting on, or if I was even aware of it, were you? The idea that he was gonna buy the company, to me initially seemed like, oh, he's not gonna be really serious about this. It's gonna be uh, like the way you sort of, you know, put in a reservation on like a fancy sports car. There have been a couple moments where I'm like, oh, I started this thing with some other people a long right. time ago in this little office, and then the world's richest man bought it. Right. And it's this big news story. It's like, how did, how did that happen? That's weird. Was there any part of you that was like, oh, this is interesting, maybe it's a I little exciting? Totally, yes. I like interesting things to happen. Right. I don't, I'm not a fan of things staying the way they are. I mean, the, that's why we do tech. That's why we start new things. Twitter had been getting better and better. Actually, the trajectory of improvements in the year or two uh, prior to Elon. But then it was like, Elon, holy, holy moly, he does crazy things. This will be interesting and fun. We'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we and may then... differ on this point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was just concerned because like everything he was talking about that he wanted to do with the product seemed pretty lightly considered. We got to defeat all the bots and, yeah. you know, we, we, there's all this stuff about like the culture wars. But it became clear over time that, no, that is his primary interest in owning the platform is mm -hmm. the kind of push on these particular cultural uh, issues and his own personal use of the product he wants to make better. So how do you feel about what he's done so far? I don't think he's dialed it in quite <laughs> right yet. Well, it's gone pretty poorly. <laughs> I mean, of just objectively speaking, the moves fast sort of mythos is belied by that most of the things that have been pushed out the door, like Twitter blue or view counts, make sure you amplify my tweets so that everyone sees them. Uh, which is, again, if you own the product, you can do that. It's just a curious way to product manage a Guess global platform. Guess who's here to talk more? Emily Chang, host of The Circuit. Congratulations. Thank you. Emily, they could laugh and be lighthearted, but it must be emotional. And moreover, they were observers. There were people there in the trenches who it was deeply emotional for, and you got to speak to them too. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, Ev, it was interesting because, you know, he started off, you know, I was, I was interested. I thought, you know, maybe this could be cool, but when it actually happened, I was sad, you know, I didn't think it was actually going to happen and I was surprised at my own emotion. And he added that, yes, Elon Musk is brilliant, but nobody's brilliant about everything. And I did talk to four former employees, a couple who were fired, one who was laid off, one who resigned, and they were also sad. So I think there's this level of grief at what could have been. Um, and the idea that Twitter's never going to be what it once was, even if it wasn't perfect, right? Even if it had a lot of work to do, even if things needed to be changed, um, you know, we're not going back to that. I think it's going to be hard. Emily, one of the few perks of this job is that I have seen the full episode. No spoilers <laughs> here. But, you know, it's really authentic. You know, those are two well-known names. They balance kind of acknowledging that Twitter needed to change with it was it's not a success so far. What else can we expect in the series to come? What personalities? What kind of observations? So, you know, as you both know, I've been host I hosted this show for a really long time and it was so amazing to talk to all of these people over the course of 12 years. What I really wanted to do with the circuit was go out into the field and spend more time with these people who are making huge decisions that are affecting the lives of billions and billions of people. So, you know, we're going into Brian Chesky, the CEO of Airbnb's home. We are talking to Bill Gurley over barbecue in Texas. You're seeing Natalie Portman there, who just uh, founded a women's soccer team, talking about how to apply tech models to women's sports. Satya Nadella. Uh, we're going inside OpenAI. And, you know, it was just a huge opportunity to talk about how tech right. is changing at this moment in time. No spoilers, but Emily and I will be doing a Twitter Spaces at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific later, and we'll give you some more details. Emily Chang, so good to see you. New episodes of The Circuit airing every Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg TV. You can also catch it on the Bloomberg app, 8 p.m. Eastern, Bloomberg.com, and the Companion Podcast. That's it for Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.